Hello, my name is Patrick Clark. And I'm Jack Litzy. And today we are interviewing Mr. Fred Gettleman in Brookfield, Wisconsin. Today is December 13th, 2019. All right, Mr. Gettleman, thank you again for joining us and letting us uh, interview for this oral history. Um, so I'm just going to start it off. So where and when were you born? Uh, I was born in Asheville, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. um, when? In 1945. Mm -hmm. And uh, why were you born in Asheville, North Carolina, and, or how did you end up here? Uh, well, my father was in the Air Force. Mm -hmm. And I was in Asheville for, I think, five weeks before we moved back here and we're back in Wisconsin by Christmas. So how long was your father in the military? Uh, almost three years. Did it affect the brewery at all? I mean, you, they were missing a employee, if you will, yeah, okay. I suppose. Um, was life any different growing up with a military father? Or did it? Well, I didn't grow up with him by the time, it was 1945, the war was over. Yeah. Um, what is your earliest memory, if you could think of one? The very earliest memory? Yes. Um, you know, probably something that would be dramatic, something like Christmas is something you would remember, I think. Mm -hmm. A lot of activity, a lot of excitement. Um, I think there was this, you know, I remember the snowstorm in 1949, I think that was kind of a big deal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, tell us a little bit about the snowstorm of 1949. Well, what I remember, there's just a lot of snow. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, and people were tied up and couldn't get around and stuff like that at the time, I know. Uh, so, going to your childhood, uh, we understand that you grew up in Wauwatosa, correct? Right. Uh, what activities did you enjoy as a kid? Well, we lived just a block from Menominee River Parkway, so um, at a young age we did a lot of ice skating on the rink they had on the, on the lagoon pond down there. Um, and uh, otherwise, just growing up was going to school and and uh, summers we went up north to our, our cabin and stuff, okay. cottage. Yeah, and you explained that um, you went to many different grade schools because they changed name or something like that. Could you just list the grade schools? No, when I started school, I went to, first of all, Webster. And um, then from Webster, went to Wilson and then Longfellow. No, and then um, Hawthorne and then Longfellow. And then Wauwatosa East, and then Wauwatosa West, because the schools were being built during that time. That was a huge period of growth with the uh, the baby boom, I guess, if you will, and stuff like that. Did you have a favorite of any of those? Um, no, I kind of liked Wauwatosa East. I was only there a year before Wauwatosa West was built, and then we went out there. Um, no, I can't say that I had a favorite. Okay. Um, were you involved in any sports in grade school or extracurriculars activities? You remember? Um, not a great deal because our summers, we were gone all summer. So anything that transferred over to the summer, I, I was on the swimming team in junior high school and I was in band in junior high school, but I pretty well dropped out of those things in high school. Okay. Um, what do you remember about Wauwatosa at the time that have changed like over time? Well, I think the most dramatic thing is the village, certainly. I mean, the village was a very small village, a drugstore and the normal things you have in a small village. And then Water Wauwatosa kind of, I think, for lack of another word, kind of petered out for a while. And then in the last 20 years, it's just had this, you know, I don't know how many apartment units have been added, you know, in the village and, and the number of restaurants and stuff like this. It's had quite the resurgence, I think. Yeah. Um, what do you remember about the brewery at this time, if anything? Um, well, Dad worked there and spent a lot of time there. Uh, when I was going to Wauwatosa East in Longfellow, actually, uh, after school, I'd either walk down there or take a bus to the brewery to get a ride home um, with him and, you know, then spend time with, after work, they always had people in the uh, hospitality room and stuff like that. Yeah. So I learned to tap beer at a very early age. <laughs> Nice. Uh, were there any, like, uh, bring your kids to school day or bring your kids to work day or anything like that? No, they didn't have that, but I was yeah. I was there, you know, several days a week, it seems like. All right. Um, do you remember 
or your parents or anybody talking about how prohibition affected the Gettleman Brewing? Well, all, all brewing operations were, were ceased and people had to find something else to do. And grandfather was kind of a engineer type individual. He, had, he held several patents, I think eight or nine different patents on farm machinery and then the snowplow was something that uh, he latched on to. And that's pretty much they turned over production uh, in the plant to um, making snowplows. Uh, so you explained that you attended Wauwatosa East originally. Um, what were the reasons you chose to go there for high school? Well, my dad went to Wauwatosa schools, and I think, you know, we lived in Wauwatosa. It was just kind of a natural thing at the time. You know, I don't... Yeah, were, was Marquette High, Pius, or any other high schools a consideration? No, they really weren't. They really weren't at that time. Um... And you also explained that you were a national champion for trap shooting during high school. Uh, like, how, how did you get involved in trap shooting? Well, that was the biggest sport I think I probably was involved in. Um, I would say when I was about uh, 13 years old is when we started. His dad did quite a bit of hunting, both bird and animal. And um, it was just kind of natural to pick up a shotgun, or if you wanted to be with him, you learned how to do that. And uh, he pretty much took my brother and I and we spent a lot of time in Waukesha Gun Club and um, ended up just, you know, for about, what would that be, seven or eight, seven years, just shot on weekends and traveled around the state and things like that. So how was, I'm not sure how the competition was involved, but how was the national tournament or national competition? Did you go somewhere around the country that was pretty interesting or well the, the grand american it was called was the biggest trap shooting uh, tournament and that was down in vandalia ohio <clears throat> and there was you know thousands of people involved in that and uh the the one thing i did win was a, it was a junior championship in handicap and i actually won it with the lowest score that ever won it <laughs> <laughs> which was still a damn good score of course um uh, you also told us that you were a student host for uh, John F. Kennedy. Could you explain a little oh, bit? A, a Longfellow, uh, my civics teacher was Monica McCauley, and her dad was the uh, district attorney in Milwaukee. So they were very actively involved democratically. Um, so she needed some volunteers to, to work at the Kennedy Jackson dinner downtown when he came to town in 1960, um, 62, I believe. Mm-hmm. Or 61, that would have been, 61. Um, at this time, uh, when you were in high school, your father sold the brewery. Uh, how did this, like, impact your family? Um, I don't know how it impacted the family. Obviously, he, he went on to do something else. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he just, I wasn't going to the brewery after <laughs> anymore. What did your father do after selling the brewery? Uh, he went, we, my, my uncle and he went to Freighter Malt um, and ran Freighter Malt for, you know, a number of years until he finally retired. And the reason he did that was Gettleman was a small brewery. It was the fifth largest brewery in Milwaukee. Mm -hmm. But there was a big gap between the big four and then Gettleman, of course, a very large gap. But he had the wherewithal to be able to talk to small brewers in the United States. So when he was selling a malt, he could sympathize or or talk to him about their problems or their processes or, you know, what he knew. And so it was a good, it was a good deal for him and for the company. Mm -hmm. um, was this a big adjustment for your family? Just uh, like selling a brewery that's been your family for quite a long time? Well, I think there was a lot of emotion involved and stuff like that. But the timing, at the time, the timing seemed, you know, very right. Mm -hmm. uh, Advertising was very, very expensive, and advertising is done on a per barrel basis kind of thing. And their barrelage wasn't near what the big ones were. And and um, you know, it's all about advertising. The product, the product matters certainly, but um, how you get the word out, and how you keep the word out, and how you keep the people's attention about your product is what's important. And those costs were getting pretty expensive. Mm -hmm. So you would say your father showed no regret in his decision to sell the brewery. Well, I don't know. I, I know they talked to my, my dad and my uncle. Uncle Dad was chairman of the board and Uncle Tom was president. Um, you know, they, they talked about it. You know, you always reflect on things and, you know, after you've done something, is that right? Is it wrong? Should we? Shouldn't we have? Or whatever. But what we did, we did. And now what we're doing is what we're doing. Mm -hmm. 
Um, you mentioned that your family were season ticket holders for the Braves uh, as during like a time where they were very popular in Milwaukee. Um, do you have any specific memories from their World Series run? Um, yeah, nineteen fifty-seven for sure. The, the the well, the family had tickets, but I mean, it was a brewery that had season tickets, and they used them for entertaining, of course, and things like that. Um, but we did attend quite a few games, and also the All Star Game uh, was before that when I was in Milwaukee, and we got, to, you know, just from being involved with them and being a supporter of the thing, and um, you know, the brewery obviously selling a lot of beer at the ballpark, met most of the players and stuff like that at different events and and things. Yeah. Uh, so what was the energy like in Milwaukee when County Stadium was built uh, and Milwaukee was going to host like its first major league team like, previous to the World Series run? Well, you know, again, I was pretty young, so I don't really know what it was like when it was built. Okay. But I do, my, my experiences there were great. I, I really liked Milwaukee County Stadium and I can't say I was crazy about the new one until you get used to the new one and you realize whether can be your enemy and not your friend, and it's awfully nice not to get wet at a ball game yeah. or cold. Uh -huh. um, and going back to the All Star Game in the World Series run, uh, you said you like talked to a lot of players, and or maybe not talked to them, but you have maybe had interactions with them. Do you have any specific memories or like like any players really stick out to you that you had interactions? Well, there was with? there. I had um, I was in the hospital for. I'm trying to think what it was. I think I had. Um, I don't think they knew what I had. It wasn't a big deal. But anyways, at that, time, at that time, they put you in the hospital. And then one of the guy, players I really liked was Billy Bruton. And he was in the hospital at the same time. So a lot of players came and visited him. And they, they knew that I liked Billy Bruton. So I had a lot of visits from the players at that couple of days I was in the hospital. Uh, that was kind of interesting. People would say, how do you know? How do you know that? How do you know yeah. that? Yeah. Yeah. Um... So do you think has uh, Miller Park has changed the atmosphere of baseball in Milwaukee? Well, look at the attendance figures. I mean, you know, before Miller Park, it was a big deal to have a million, you know, every time they hit a million attendance was was kind of cool. And now we're hitting two and a half, three. Did we hit three million last year or something like that almost? It's pretty phenomenal numbers. Yeah. Uh, so just going back to your high school days, uh, what would you do on the weekends with your friends? Like any specific hangout spots or? Uh, if we weren't, no, if we weren't shooting, um, on a weekend, we'd go up north. Okay. Uh, you know, so I didn't do a lot around Milwaukee, really. Okay. Where up north would you go? Uh, Puckaway Lake, okay. right next to Green Lake. Uh, Grandpa had a farm up there, and then we had a cottage and stuff like that. Uh, living in Wauwatosa and some place that some establishment that's still around uh, that I go to sometimes is uh, Gillies. Yeah. So, do you remember Gillies from your high school? Oh, absolutely. I mean, there? yeah. I mean, driving down there was a big deal. Yeah. And then um, the other place, I mean, Brookfield was a. It seemed like a very far distance away. Um, Oh my gosh! I just forgot the name of the pizza place in Brookfield. I mean, when we drove out to that Marty's, that was that was a big deal. You actually were making somewhat of a trip out to, and then Carter's was on the corner of Blue Mound and Barker Road, and that was a diner, aluminum diner, and we drove all this way out. You were, you know, there was nothing on Blue Mound. Mm -hmm. uh, All right, so moving on to your college days. Uh, you told us you went to Milton College. Uh, what, what was the reason for attending there? Um, the size and the distance, pretty much. Um, and they took me. Uh, <laughs> all that comes into play. Mm -hmm. uh, it, was, it was just a user-friendly, a very user-friendly situation. Uh, did you intend on continuing like uh, competitive trap shooting in college or no? Well, it wasn't offered at, at that school. Um, and then, you know, all of a sudden you're in college and other other things happen and stuff like that. Uh, what did you study at Milton College? Uh, business and actually speech and drama. Hmm. Uh, what were your reasons for taking those courses? Uh, I, I, I spent five years and uh, it was, it was uh, what did I have the most credits in it got down to? And that's all of a sudden what uh, we concentrated on. <laughs> right. um, 
you said after Milton College you uh, taught? Or I taught, to, taught high school for two years, taught Spanish. Yeah, at Marquesan. At Marquesan, right. Sorry. Um, how did that, how did Marquesan compare to Milwaukee? Well, Marquesan is a town of about 2,400 people at the time. Yeah. Um, and it was, it was only 11 miles, or actually 14 miles, I think, from our cottage. So I stayed up there, lived in the, in the cottage mostly. Um, and it was just, it was a good experience, but it was a small town. And, you know, at that age, you want kind of sometimes a little bigger town. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, after Marcus Ann, uh, you explained how you ran a restaurant in Madison. How did that go? Well, what, what, what I did the whole time I was teaching, actually, be, while I was in college, I started attending bar at Green Lake. And I got to know a lot of people. So I actually probably attended bar in around Green Lake for six or seven years and uh, became, well, the family was very good friends of the Heidels. And I became friends of the Heidel's sons uh, who were contemporaries and um, they had a lot of different business interests. And one of them was a restaurant in Madison, which they said, why don't you, why don't you run that for us? Because we're having trouble finding somebody to run it. Mm -hmm. uh, so how did that go? Um, it was a fondue restaurant. And it was totally authentic. All the furniture and everything was brought over from Switzerland. Uh, the the menus, everything was was very authentic Swiss. And I think it was a little bit ahead of the curve. Um, you know, weekends business was fine. Uh, we were just on the square, so we didn't have a lot of. You you think you had some walk-in traffic, but we didn't have as much as we anticipated. Uh, we we're right on Mifflin Street, and um, it was it was spotty. It was it was all right. It was a great experience, but um, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, did you enjoy Madison over Milwaukee? Or? Oh yeah, Madison. I mean, come on. I mean, <laughs> Madison was a great town. Okay. Um, and then, what motivated you to move to Iowa? Idaho. Or Idaho. Sorry. Idaho. Sorry. Um, then another opportunity came up, and um, in fact, it was through I had one of the deals when I taught high school. Marquesan had two canning companies, and we had a lot of a very heavy migrant population this summer that worked at the canning companies. So one of the deals was the school said you have to teach a evening adult Spanish class. So the storekeepers and stuff like this have a little bit of knowledge of the language when they're dealing with all these migrant workers. So I did that. I met one of the persons that took um, the class uh, was a person that owned a canning company, as a matter of fact. Um, and we got along really, really well. And he had other business interests, and he had one that was out in Idaho. And um, he said, Fred, I think you should move to Idaho and help run this business. Um, so I went out and looked at it. I was kind of impressed. It happened to be a, a Idaho rainbow trout farm. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was just getting off the ground, more or less. Um, so I decided to do that, just something totally different, and you know, move out of Wisconsin and see another part of the country and see the West. As Brigham Young said, move west. <laughs> what was uh, your favorite? Or Horace Greeley, excuse me, that's Horace Greeley. Uh, <laughs> Go west, young man. <laughs> what was your family's reaction to this? Um, well, we were kind of close to that family. I said, you sure you want to move? You yeah. sure you want to go to Idaho? Uh, I said, yeah, let me give it a try. And, you know, fortunately I was in a situation that I was able to get home, you know, at least at least four times a year, I think. And they came out and visit and stuff like that. So it wasn't, um, I wasn't totally removed. Mm -hmm. uh, so what city in Idaho was it in? This was, strangely enough, I said Marquesan was a small town. This was in, the closest town to the trout farm was Hagerman, Idaho. And that was a town of like 200 people. Oh, wow. So I went in the wrong direction as far as population. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you were very successful uh, selling potatoes, running a fish farm, uh, selling tractors all in Idaho. Uh, but can you talk a little bit about your Dodge dealership that didn't work out? Well, uh, as no, what, 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 wait, there's, a, there's a national trigger, transgression here. We build up the trout farm, and we're selling about a million pounds of trout a year. Mm -hmm. And um, then there was some interest by, this is when aquaculture really became very hot and very, very, company of the business of the moment type thing and um, we got involved with some people from New York a company and they um, they ended up buying us 
And um, so that was fine. So I worked with them for a year. And then after that year, um, I was looking for something else to do. And uh, one of my, actually my attorney out there said, well, we should go buy a potato farm because we had this money from selling the farm. So we, um, we, we actually developed a potato farm is what we did. It's all irrigated out there and um, bought a section of ground, 640 acres, and, and uh, started growing potatoes and rotating crops and stuff like that. And that, that progressed from, um, you know, so it's a share crop type basis. You have a farmer, he, you get put up the money for the crops and all stuff, he does the labor and, and um, that, and then you share the, the proceeds at the end of the year at harvest time. And the deal was I was gonna help him and be a farmer, and he, after, after me driving the tractor for a while and stuff like this, he said, Fred, maybe you should let me do the farming and you find something else to do. So what am I gonna do? So in the meantime, I got to know all the farmers up there in this development where the potato farm was. And um, uh, there was a person retiring that had a Massey Ferguson dealership in a town about 15 miles away. And um, so I approached them and stuff like that. And I ended up buying that dealership and um, started selling Massey Ferguson tractors to the people I had met and uh, built that business up pretty well. It was, it was a pretty small little storefront type business and uh, we got it going and growing and built it on the freeway, a uh, nice new building and you know, gave it, really lifted it up to a, a, a dealership that could compete with the likes of John Deere and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, and then I had this big new building, what I was gonna do, and the farmer said, well, can't you find some pickups to sell too or something like that? And um, I almost had the Ford dealership bought, but that kind of fell through. So the only thing left was uh, Chrysler at the time, 1979. And um, two weeks after they awarded me my dealership, of course, they declared bankruptcy, mm -hmm. which was interesting. And um, it didn't really affect, you know, people were worried about, well, what about warranties and those kind of stuff. But obviously the Chrysler carried on and Lee Iacocca did a good job with them. Uh, but the quality wasn't the same as Ford and Chevy at that time. It, just, you know, it took a while for them to come up with this Dodge Ram uh, and really, really be competitive. It took a number of years to be competitive with the other guys. Um, and that was, that was a tough business. I had to end up closing that. Uh, just we didn't have quite the volume we needed to make it work. Uh, so on a completely other different note, uh, when did you first meet your wife? Well, I met her in Idaho. Um, one of the, um, at the fish farm, the, my, uh, our, our fish scientist or ichthyologist, if you will, uh, was a young fellow my age that he had studied in California, was from the area and moved back up and he and I became pretty good friends. And so he, you know, we'd go out and he introduced me to all the local people and stuff like that. And uh, he, uh, he and his best friend, you know, we kind of skied together in, in Sun Valley and stuff like this. And through that, um, he introduced me to uh, who I ended up marrying. Mm -hmm. They went to high school together. Uh, when and where did you get married? We got married in Gooding, Idaho um, in 1974. Um, what was your motivation to go back to Milwaukee? Uh, well, so I closed the Chrysler dealership and... Um, it was, it was one of those things that my parents were getting older and by this time we had two um, children. And as I said, we lived in a town of 200 people and the school was small, um, although it did have people coming in from surrounding areas obviously, but it was still a small school. And um, I just thought, you know, I had an opportunity kind of presented itself that John Deere offered to buy my by, well, actually, they, they wanted the business. They leased the building from me, and I, I gave it the Massey Ferguson thing, and John Deere still has it to this day, and they've added on to it. It's a, it's a magnificent dealership uh, building and stuff like that. So I was proud of how I built it and designed it, um, and to see that it's still going strong today is what it was designed to do. Um, so it just made sense at that time. Timing was good. Everything was good to move back here. Mm -hmm. uh were there any big changes that you noticed in Milwaukee when you returned? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, Summerfest didn't exist when I left, I don't believe. Mm -hmm. um, 
So that was kind of a big deal. And then we, as soon as we moved back, we, we looked in Wauwatosa when we moved back, but we were used to bigger lots and stuff like that. So that's one of the reasons we ended up in Brookfield. Um, and uh, some of our neighbors, I think we went that summer right away, you know, they said, well, we'll take you down to Summerfest. Mm -hmm. I said, you know, what's that? So that was, that was kind of cool. And to see the, the growth of Summerfest and, um, um, I'm trying to think who, what act we saw that very first year was um, Jimmy Buffett, as a matter of oh. fact. Uh, so, you know, he was, it was kind of the beginning of Jimmy Buffett. And, uh, you know, that's kind of history, too. Mm -hmm. sure. Were there big buildings or anything that you noticed that were built over time? Well, the Marine Bank was the biggest building that was built in the 60s. And then... Uh, you know, first Wisconsin obviously came in, but we, Milwaukee was not a town of high rises when you drove into it. Like, you know, when you travel, you drive in other towns, you see all this nice skyline. Milwaukee is finally getting the skyline between the buildings and the uh, apartment buildings. Yeah. Um, hmm. uh, how had Mayor Meyer shaped Milwaukee, do you think? Well, between, I mean, he was a mayor for 26 years. How many years was he mayor? It was um, a very long time. He had his hands in everything. I mean, uh, uh, you know, he must have encouraged the growth and, and stuff, you know, to keep the keep everything on track and, and keep it running pretty smoothly at that time. Uh, you know, that was a time that wasn't near as complicated as today. Uh, it seems like with you know, the finances of the city today, people are questioning and those kind of things didn't really come up. You didn't, you weren't talking about that stuff at that time. You know, wages were different, things were different. Uh, did you have uh, any memory of the civil rights movement in Milwaukee when you returned or was that normally, or did that happen when you were in Idaho? That pretty much happened with Grappi and stuff when I was in Idaho. Okay. And that was pretty much over, although, you know, I kept track of things pretty much being out there. You didn't have the internet to be right on top of things, but um, you keep up with the news. Mm -hmm. uh, did you attend any ethnic festivals back in the day? Yeah. From what you remember? Yeah, we went to. Um, we went to at one point or another. I think we well, we always went to German fest, certainly, certainly, and Irish fest. Um, I think we went to Mexican fest once. I'm not sure. Yeah, and. Uh, yeah, when they were available, yeah, you know, we didn't make them all, I guess, but we made quite a few. Mm -hmm. uh, can you talk a little bit about the Gettleman Mansion, um, just like as a preserved historic building in Milwaukee, and like uh, just talk a little bit about the history about it, and like which relatives built it, or like how long it's been around. Which which what uh, what specifically are you asking about? Do you, the Gettleman Mansion? Um, I don't know. There's 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 a house on 2929 Highland Boulevard mm -hmm. that had a sign in front of it for quite a while called the Gettleman Mansion. That was actually the Starkey House. Okay. And uh, when Grandpa Starkey died, or this would be great grandfather Starkey, um, his his daughter was my grandfather's his his daughter was my grandfather's wife. Okay. And when he died, then Grandpa. And uh, Grandma moved in with Grandma Starkey, and they had four children, my dad and my uncle and two sisters. And so they lived in the house for a number of years until they built a house in the Highlands. So I don't believe, I, I'm not positive of this, but I don't believe a Gettleman was ever on a title to that house. Okay. When they built a new house in the Highlands, which was a rather substantial home, um, and then Grandma Starkey moved in with them until she passed away. Our great grandmother Starkey. Yeah. What were the Highlands like in Wauwatosa? What were they like? Yeah, growing up. A uh, super, super neighborhood. I mean, you know. Now I never was in the Highlands. Mm -hmm. I did. We did look at when we moved back here. I did look at buying a house there, but uh, my budget was such that you know all these needed a lot of a lot of rehab, mm -hmm. and um, I just didn't feel I could handle the what it would take to put some of those houses back together and bring them up to, up to date at this time. Um, but the Highlands, I think, well, it was the number one neighborhood in Wauwatosa for sure, mm -hmm. as far as a whole complex neighborhood. There were good streets in Wauwatosa. 
going back to Wauwatosa, so when you were a child, you said you lived close to Manali River Parkway. Right. Did you ever go swimming in the summer? Or no, because you were up north? Right. No, we went to Hoyt Park, maybe. Okay. What was Hoyt Park like back then? Pretty basic. You know, the, the pool size was, I think, the same as it is today. Okay. But, I mean, it was just, just a pool, yeah. not a water park. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did you go there with friends? Huh? Did you go there with friends? Yeah. yeah. Uh, you explained that uh, you were able to meet George Wallace. Can you explain this experience? Well, when I was teaching... Um, Spanish in high school, you know, I tried to get out and, and give the students a lot of different experiences. And he was speaking in Oshkosh, and I asked the um, principal, I said, you know, if a bunch of kids, if, you know, can I take six or eight guy students over there? It might be interesting. And um, so we did that one day. You know, I tried to get out and about and do different things with the, you know, with the students too. Uh, so that was, that was interesting to hear him speak. You know, I look at things as a part of history. Yeah. You know, if you can experience something or see something or why not? Can you talk about what he was speaking about? Um, no, I really can't remember. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, Did you see any other speakers? Oh, gosh. Yeah. Um, yeah, what can I think of? I, I try to take advantage of, you know, when you've got the time and the, and the things come together, you want to you wanna take advantage of it when you can. I, I can't think of, um, I'll have to think. Okay. Then in Milwaukee, did you meet any prominent speakers when you came back? Um, yeah, as a matter of fact, um, several. Uh, I, I used to go to um, Qantas meetings downtown at the War Memorial Center and, and Rotary meetings as a guest whenever they have a major speaker in, like, um, you know, General, um, or the, uh, um, you know, the Secretary of the Treasury at the time. Uh, uh, you know, people like that, I took advantage of those opportunities when I was in when I was invited, or when, in some cases, where I invited myself. <laughs> Did you attend any other events in Milwaukee when you came back, like sporting events? Well, obviously the Brewers, um, and then uh, when the Packers played in Milwaukee, I, you know, went to those games pretty much, and that was a great deal of, so of did, fun. Where did they play in Milwaukee? At Milwaukee kind of Stadium. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you know, it was, it, the field laid out kind of funny. Yeah. Did you attend any basketball games? Uh, not very many. Mar I, if, I think I attended more Marquette games than I did any of the Bucks games, actually, because okay. I had friends that went to Marquette, so we'd go down there and go to the games. Did you ever get to see the Mecca floor? No, not. I don't. I, well, I don't know. You know, you we talked about that. Um, yeah, I, I can't remember specifically. I wasn't. I guess I wasn't looking down enough. <laughs> <laughs> Did you attend like any museums? There? Yeah, we're, yeah, I, I, I love museums. Um, yeah, I've gone to most of the displays at the, the Art Center and uh, the Milwaukee Public Museum. And now that Discovery World is here, that's pretty impressive. You know, it was it was nice when it was next to the museum, but when when Cudahy did the whole thing on the lakefront, I mean, that's pretty fabulous. Very impressive. And the Harley Museum. Let's not forget that one. Mm -hmm. Did you ever own a Harley? Or? I had, uh, my dad made me have two Harleys. Really? And, uh, I, and that was because he grew up with the Davidsons in, um, in the Highlands. Oh, wow. And so they were all good friends. And dad drove motorcycles for a long time uh, until he got married anyways. And then that was cut out. So he always, he missed the motorcycles. And you know, Davidson said, well, get your kid a motorcycle. Get your... So he got me one when I was in college and I didn't like it. And he said, well, we'll get you a bigger one. Maybe you'll like that. And I think he just got it because he'd drive it down to school and he had the fun of using it and this kind of thing. And I said, geez, Dad, two wheels. Just why, why, why does somebody want two wheels? Four makes so much more sense to me. <laughs> so, um, so we ended up getting rid of the second one. I think this lasted about a year. A year and through the summer. I did have it through one summer. Did you go road tripping with it? Um, just like driving the lake and, you know, then at college I had friends that had a, a Triumph, two of my best friends had a Triumph and the other had a BSA. Okay. And those were actually faster bikes than what mine was and they could outdo me. Uh, Harley was a big, heavy, you know, slower bike, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, and we did, we did drive around, we did take some trips with, you know, kind of around the different lakes and stuff like that. 
So would you go to like the Harley reunions that come to morning? No, I was not. I don't have a Harley shirt <laughs> <laughs> or jacket. So you said your dad was or tattoo. friends with the uh, Davidsons growing up? Yeah. Uh, so would you ever visit the like Harley manufacturer ever at all when you were growing up? Um, no, I never did. I had a friend that worked there I, at one time, so I went to the plant once with him. Okay. Okay. What was that like, the plant? Was it... Well, the the assembly is you know was done in Pennsylvania actually, okay. and the engines are just kind of made here. Okay, okay. How had breweries and the whole brewing life changed in Milwaukee when you returned? Well, to think that you know in the period of time since you know when they sold, that virtually every brewery now is owned offshore. Uh, not locally owned, and the fact that Miller right now brews Blatz, Pabst, and Schlitz. You know, who would have ever thought, you know, the E-Lines, can you imagine what they think today? The Pabst actually was sold after Prohibition. You know, the, the ownership of that left, and Blatz was sold in the 50s to another industry in New York. Uh, but now all those are being brewed by, until they lose that contract anyways, Miller is brewing a, a large number of beers. You know, they're a contract brewer as much as they are another brewer and uh, you know all that's changing now with with the Molson and the Coors and now they're even going to drop the name Miller from the actual it used to be Miller Coors now it's going to be Molson Coors mm -hmm. and it, at the Miller Brewery so the Miller Brewery will always be there but not in the corporate name. Mm -hmm. And the Gettleman Brewery where was that located? Uh, Miller's 4000 West State Street and Gettleman is 44000 West State Street so it was four blocks west. Was there any tension, right? No, they no place? no because we were so much smaller. Everybody got along just fine. Uh, you know, they were it was very friendly, and all the all the breweries were friendly. They had no reason not to be, but we were all in the same union. Mm -hmm. um, you know, all the employees were in the the together. So union negotiations always got a little tougher because the bigger guys could maybe afford more of a raise than the than the, the little. The, the other brewery in Milwaukee was independent brewery at the time, and they were a little smaller than we were. So you had two little guys and four giants, if you will. What was union life like in Milwaukee? What was it like? What do you remember? Well, it was, um, you know, there was there was a big strike in, uh, I'm trying to think, 53, I think. And, uh, you know, it was very friendly, at, except they were on strike, but it was very friendly. and. You know, I I was down there enough that actually they've got pictures of me carrying a strike sign <laughs> with the with the union guys, which <laughs> is kind of interesting. Um, you know, I was like eight years old or seven years old or something. Uh, so I I don't really know. You know, ours ours was you know there's a hundred employees. It was very amiable. It was very family like from what I remember. You know, you go through a plant, everybody, hi how are you, and you just know everybody, or at least certainly my dad did, and they knew who I was. <laughs> I know Gettleman had a $1,000 beer challenge. Can you explain that? $1,000 beer was brewed in the 1890s by Adam Gettleman. And um, it the, the deal was there was other substitutes to brew beer, rice and corn. But the old Reinsgobot theory formula from Germany it had to be pure malt and hops. But other breweries were you know, using substitutes because it was cheaper. And Adam said, I'm never going to do that. I'm going to brew a beer. And if anybody can prove that I've used any sort of substitute besides pure malt and hops, um, I'll give them $1,000. So it just, that came up, we'll call it $1,000 beer. And of course, nobody could prove that he did because he didn't. Mm -hmm. Was that a big thing for publicity too? Yeah, it was a premium beer. You know, that was... That was more of the premium beer. It was a little more expensive than the other beer, but they used that to justify it. Mm -hmm. What was Gettleman's slogan? Get, get, Gettleman. Uh, pretty simple. <laughs> Do you think that helped to bring attention to the company? Yeah, I think I think locally the company, locally and certainly in the state and a little bit in the mid, the Chicago, there was the Chicago market, um, yeah, you know, it was a re very respected company. When you came back to Milwaukee, um, there were many new parks around. Do you ever attend 
different events at those parks? No. Um, I don't know there's a lot of new parks. You know, the lakefront was always something to go down to. Um, and, you know, uh, McKinley and, and uh, Bradford Beach. Um, I, I can't, um, you know, we're, the park we used was Menominee River Parkway, you know, to hike and bike and stuff like that. How had the Menominee River Parkway changed? Just more residential? Well, it's 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 certainly not it's it's a it's a you know it still remains a parkway, but the lagoon where we ice skated, you know, that's all gone. They had a warming shed there, and you know we're talking sixty, you know, sixty years ago. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I think it's uh, it's been kept up, but it doesn't have I don't think the same usage. Well, I think parts of it do. They've got some. Uh, you see soccer being played and stuff like that, but, but there's so many things that have moved out to bigger bigger fields. Uh, that set up more in our, you know, look at what Brookfield's got, my, you know, soccer all over the place and mm -hmm. stuff like that. How about the water quality since you were so close to Menominee River? Well, it, you know, the, it was, yeah, I think it went through a period, it seemed like it was very clean when I was growing up. Uh, you know, you'd people fishing and stuff like that, then I think it's, it went way down. You look at the, you know, it went through a period where, I know when we'd walk along or something, there'd be all sorts of, junk and stuff on the sides and stuff like uh, on the side of the river on the river banks and now that's been cleaned up and I think it's a little much better. We used to go down and catch frogs and uh, uh, tadpoles and watch them grow in frogs. I mean they were just all over the place. Uh, of course I gave that up. Did you go fishing in the Mile River? Park? No, I never fished there. Well, where did you fish if you did fish? Up north. <laughs> okay. Pewaukee Lake a little bit but mostly up north. What was your uh, target fish? Um, well, anything but as far as something to eat, you know, walleye would certainly be, mm -hmm. and perch, yep. panfish. Yep. Did anybody uh, try to go fishing with you in Milwaukee, like try to bring you along? No, again, we were just, you know, we we're in, in summers, we would leave after school and wouldn't come back to Milwaukee until school started. Mm. We were gone literally all summer. Mm. And Dad would come up on uh, Friday afternoons or evening, and he'd leave early Monday morning. So he commuted from up north, so to speak. Mm. How had, so you already mentioned this a little bit, that the lakefront changed quite a bit. Did you go down there often? Um, well, I wouldn't say we went down often, but... Um, you know, went down enough. It, it you know, it's, it's gone through again. Every it's amazing. It's kind of fun to see the changes. Uh, right now, it's very vibrant in what they've done with all the volleyball courts and the activities on weekends. And um, you know, there's a time where it just it go it just everything cycles. And I think that's it's on a good cycle right now. The lakefront's on a very good cycle with the building, the high rises, and, and stuff like that. The activities. Yeah, I was going to ask about that. Um, what do you think is the main building of Milwaukee now than when you were when you first came back? How do you mean that? Like, the, what was the big attraction in Milwaukee? Like the big building? Because now you have the Northwestern Mutual. Right. Well, I th I think uh, you know uh, first Wisconsin was being built in that biggest tallest building in the state, mm -hmm. uh, so that really stood out in Milwaukee skyline. I mean, that really made the skyline, if you will. It's dwarfed. Uh, the Marine Bank building, which I think was the second biggest at the time, and they had a good restaurant on top of it, the top of the Marine. Uh, that was like going to a big restaurant in Chicago on the top of the building or top of the mark or something. Um, so Milwaukee's growing up. I mean, you know, it's it's fun to see it. It's it's rewarding to see it. Milwaukee's a very user friendly city. I mean, I've traveled extensively and. You know, the price is right in Milwaukee, there's no doubt about it, compared to the coasts, or even Chicago's, you know, pretty bloody expensive. Mm -hmm. How had transportation changed, like freeways? Uh, well, it was amazing. The freeways were, were built in the, um, I'm trying to think, of it, it, like 1960s or something, you know, driving downtown, I remember going on State Street, or driving down, getting over to Wisconsin Avenue, driving all the way downtown. And then all of a sudden the freeway came in, and my gosh, I think the first time went down to um, buy some 
I did a little bit of radio work, went down to buy some stuff downtown at Olson Radio, I think, or something. And my dad and I drove down there on the freeway, and it took like nine minutes or eight minutes from our house, where it was normally a 15 or 16 or 17 minute trip and no stoplights. You know, you just commented right away, wow, this is really special. Mm -hmm. Did you go shopping downtown often? Yeah, yeah, because we didn't have, you know, we didn't have Mayfair. Um, and Mayfair took a while to build, but once Mayfair, you know, there's no question Mayfair took a lot, but downtown you had Chapman's, that was the only place there was a Chapman's, and your Boston store and Gimbel's were better, just bigger stores than what you had, you know, out out in the suburbs. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, shopping downtown was something you definitely did. Now, not so much. Yeah. <laughs> you mentioned Gimbel's, did you ever hear of Gertie? Sure. The remember? duck? Yep. Yeah, for sure. Um, but that was a big deal. I mean, when I was growing up, uh, that was a big deal. Everybody was following Gertie, and now they've got the little uh, statue over on the on the pillar. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sometimes news is pretty easy. Yeah. <laughs> the news has changed now with the age of technology. Yeah, look at the Journal, Sentinel. I mean, holy cow. They just, they're just... They're moving into an office building and just going to have offices and not many employees. And and it's a USA Today paper, which has just been sold again. To, um, yeah, the Internet's pretty well. Uh, we aren't worried about cutting down more trees, it doesn't look like. <laughs> mm -hmm. When you're growing up, did you get the Journal Sentinel? Oh, yes. Yeah. Well, we got the Sentinel in the morning, the Journal at night, right? Yeah, yeah we got both papers, yeah. plus the Wall Street Journal. Growing up, where uh, did you live in a religious family? Yes. Where did you attend? Uh, Mount Zion Lutheran Church on North Avenue. Did you attend that when you came back after coming from Idaho? No, I. Um, my wife is Catholic, okay. so I pretty much go to um, church with her. Okay. Was religion a big thing in Milwaukee growing up? Yeah, I would say so. I think everybody, everybody I knew, everybody I knew and went to school with. Went to um, went to church on Sundays and was somewhat involved. What were your Sunday activities like? Like after church, what would you do? Well, my gra where my mother's mother, my grandmother, um, her husband died young, so on Sundays, either I would I would go to church with her um, and take the bus, or um, we'd pick her up and she'd come to church with us, and then we'd go to dinner afterwards someplace either Boulevard Inn or Eugene's downtown, which was a seafood restaurant, um, or John Ernst or Carl Roches or Mater's. Um, but it was always a Sunday, you know, after that's kind of, or we went to the Wisconsin Club. You know, so that was, there's a, just a group of places you kind of went downtown and um, had, had your Sunday dinner. So you belong to the Wisconsin Club, you said? Yeah. So how have you seen that change over time? Well, it's become very, very successful. Um, Adam Gettleman was one of the founders of it. Oh. And then Grandpa Gettleman was a member, and my dad is a member. For Dad was a member for 57 or 58 years. And then I was a member. Um, and uh, it's just grown, and they've re kept restoring the house and, and really giving it you know, done a marvelous job of keeping it up. And I think, I believe it's the most successful city club in Milwaukee for sure. I mean, for sure it is. And then with them adding the, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the, um, you know, country club, uh, you know, they've got a, it's a pretty good presence. Mm -hmm. My daughter got married there, or had her reception there, I should say. And uh, How is Gettleman and related to beer gardens in Milwaukee? Gettleman never had a beer garden per se, but they supported they um, supported quite a few bars or restaurants, if you will, that had outdoor, okay. you know, had outdoor eating and stuff like that in the yeah. summer and picnic areas. Yeah. Um, so that's more or less how they did it, where they became the the main supplier, if you will, of of a couple of these little resorts or stuff. And you know, and sometimes we'd go out to them on a Saturday and just see what was going on. And I really, quite frankly, I was pretty young. I can't remember the names of them right now. Okay. Do you think 
being able to go somewhere to grab a bite to eat and drink was very important in Milwaukee. Yeah, well, yeah, I think so. And I think it's, you know, look at the, the resurgence of these beer gardens in all the parks right now. Um, you know, it's getting pretty popular and it's, it seems to be working. Plus, it's um, financially, it's good for the county. It's very good for our county park system. How would you say the parks have changed now? I think our parks are, you know, visually in pretty good shape. I know that they're, they're struggling with budgets. They're t struggling terribly with budgets and thinking of ways to create more revenue. Uh, whether, you, you know, the kind of different sponsorships you can create for the parks or something like this. And the beer gardens are a step in the right direction. Um, and it's, it's going to be an ongoing task. I mean, our parks have been, Milwaukee has been known for their parks. Uh, you know, look at the, the Lake Park was designed by um, uh, Ralph Law Olmsted. You know, that's, that's pretty good. This, he did Central Park. I mean, you know, you can't get a better name on a plan than that. Um, so I think it's been a struggle, but I think, you know, we'll preserve and maybe maybe we won't have quite as many parks, but they'll be very good. But I'm not sure. I mean, I'm not totally up on that. Mm -hmm. How important are big name designers to Milwaukee? Well, I think we've got a pretty good history of, you know, some of the buildings and stuff and figuring that, you know, we've got a fair share of, um, of uh, you know, names that we can hang our hat on. Uh, from the park design to, um, uh, you know, Taliesin, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright. I mean that we, you know, we're hanging our head on, on him around here a little bit in between Racine and Milwaukee. And uh, the Greek Orthodox Church gets a lot of attention because of that design. Um, so I think designers give some, um, some credence and credibility. Look at the Arts Center. I mean, you know, there's an international person that came to Milwaukee and, and double the budget of the building and got it done, or triple the budget. Yeah. I know in the summer, Summerfest was, was and still is something very important in Milwaukee. What was the energy like around that time? Well, it was, it was, it was, it wasn't near what it is today when it, you know, when it went the first time. Mm. I mean, the State Fair was the big, I would say, that was where you really went if you wanted crowds and confusion and all that was going on. Uh, but now Summerfest is obviously growing to be, well, I guess their attendance is pretty damn close. Uh, Summerfest was 900 some odd thousand this year. I think the State Fair got a little over a million. Um, and the runs are pretty close to the same number of days. I think Summerfest is a day shorter or something. Um, so those are the two huge events in Milwaukee, obviously. And they knew factor in the other weekends with the ethnic events. And you've got a pretty full schedule. How often do you go to uh, State Fair? We make that every year. What's your favorite exhibit? People. <laughs> <laughs> do you remember going to State Fair when you were a kid? Yeah. Yeah. And we, um, when we had the farm, and as I said, we were up there all summer, I uh, was a member of 4-H club. They get, you know, trying to find something for me to do. Mm -hmm. And I grew ducks. And um, so for a couple of years, I, I displayed at the Green Lake County Fair. Mm -hmm. And I got blue ribbons each of those years. So it was kind of fun. How has State Fair changed? Uh, just bigger. You know, I mean, the park is, the, obviously the footprint hasn't grown that much, but how you, how you, you know, evolve it is what is what changes. It's just you know more sophisticated, I think, and um, just just it's you know those are interesting things. If you've gone to other you know state fairs, Milwaukee is pretty pretty major. So I know you attended the ethnic festivals. Um, which one did you associate most with? Well, I think we like German Fest and Italian Fest. I think those are the, the two biggest. Mm -hmm. Do you, so you went, when you went to Mexican Fiesta? Well, yeah, I'm trying to think when that was because, you know, because of my Spanish. Yeah. You know, you didn't get, but I went to University of Mexico for a year, my junior year in college. Yeah. Um, and um, so that's where I got 
picked up more of the Spanish besides taking it just in classes. So I've always kind of liked that aspect of things. How important has the Spanish language been in your business adventures? Um, well, on the farming, it was it was it was good to be able to speak to you know the help we had. Um, but I'd say that's about that's about it. But traveling is awfully nice. Mm-hmm. You know, you may not be really as fluent as you'd like to be, but you certainly can pick up what somebody's saying about you. Mm-hmm. Where have you traveled? Oh, I think I've made um, 53 countries now. So I've traveled, I love traveling. I've traveled pretty extensively, mm-hmm. uh, you know, throughout Europe, throughout the Far East, uh, a little bit of South America. How does Milwaukee compare to those? Cities that you know, it's just nice to come home to Milwaukee. It's just a very, as I've said before, a very user-friendly town. Of course, it's user-friendly because you grow up here. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think um, getting around and stuff like this. But they, again, I when I go someplace, I like to study it beforehand. So I'm pretty good about getting around wherever I've gone. Mm-hmm. Um, because I, I like putting trips together. I like doing a lot of planning. I do most of the planning on the trips we take. Uh, so I, by doing that, you, you know what to expect instead of just going on a tour or going something like this where, you know, you just, I, I like to plan my hotels, I like to plan my rent-a-cars when we go, stuff like that, and, and lay out the route and know that I don't have to, um, if I want to stay someplace another day, I'm not tied to, not tied to getting on a tour bus. Mm-hmm. So you said Milwaukee is user-friendly, how so? Well, I think in every respect, getting around it, getting around Milwaukee, the price of things in Milwaukee, um, except for parking tickets. But <laughs> uh, you know, it, it's just it's just a you know again familiarity because being here. I, but I think most people that come in and say it's a very clean city. You know, I've heard that from so many people that visit because um, you go to some places, some parts of cities. You know, you go just when's the last time somebody even thought about picking up. Um, and Milwaukee generally presents itself in a much, much better light than that, a very good light. Mm-hmm. Do you think the streetcar is important in Milwaukee? I haven't figured that out yet myself. I, 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 as far as I'm concerned, the technology goes a little backwards. Um, and you know, I don't have a lot about the streetcar, but I don't understand the wires above. That's, that's something that boggles my mind. Um, mm-hmm you know, if they were in the ground or something like that, but that just seems like it comp- complicates things. And if you get stuck behind the streetcar, that's not pleasant. Uh, you know, I, I have not ridden it yet, so I really can't pass a lot of judgment. Is it nostalgic to back when you were younger, the streetcar? Well, there, was, there, there were still streetcars when I was very young. Mm-hmm. Um, is it nostalgic? Is a streetcar nostalgic? I don't, I don't know. Is that what you want? Is something nostalgic? Well, does it bring, bring back memories of traveling? I don't know. I mean, you know, when you go to Europe and stuff like that, it's, you know, they're all over the place. Mm-hmm. Europe is so much more condensed the cities are that that kind of transportation, just everything works so much easier. Uh, and we are spread out, um, you know, so that's hence the freeways and the travel times and the driving. Um, With Milwaukee being spread out, how has segregation changed? Well, I think segregation is, I don't know, it, it just seems like it's been kind of a neighborhood thing. I don't know if it's, I guess they, you know, there are different groups on the south side. You had groups on the near north side. You have groups of different groups of people where they kind of settled and grew up. And um, people after time have branched out from there, I think, as as the econ- as their economic situation gets better or something like this, uh, they move to different places. Um, you know, and some people's economic situation doesn't get better and they don't move. Mm-hmm. What was it like seeing different ethnic groups in those areas from when you were a kid? To well, I think we, oh, it was fun to go to the south side to some of the restaurants. Um, you know, there's always been a couple of good Mexican restaurants. There's a Polish restaurant on the south side. Uh, and then the, the, the Serb restaurant, you know, I mean... That was that was a nice exposure, a nice experience, and of course we had our German restaurants. But um, and then Italian, there were some good Italian restaurants that were 
you know, in the day. Uh, and then what other thing did we have? That's pretty much it, I think, between, you know, so we always had a good selection and good food. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's good. That's good. That is good. <laughs> All right. Um, uh, I just want to talk. Uh, uh, do you want to talk a little bit about your involvement, kind of giving back to Milwaukee with your contributions, like uh, just by being a part of the beer museum and everything that's working out there? Well, when I when I got back here, I um, I got back here. I was in the printing business for a number of years, mm -hmm. and we had a pretty good printing business um and then uh well 20 years ago i guess we sold the um sold the printing company and then i got into real estate and at that time i had uh, you know freed up some time and i got involved with a bunch of well what really happened was my father passed away and at his funeral i was blown away by the old employees that came up and most of them had to be driven by, you know, brought by their sons or daughters or something like this. And the stories I heard at the funeral were just, you know, were just amazing. And I'm going and thinking, you know, this history is, you know, these, where does this history go if somebody doesn't do something with it? Because all these people had such very, very good memories. Um, and then I got involved with some other people and stuff like that. And this, this beer museum idea came along. And this is this is 20 years ago. We've been working on it, so we got a group of people together and um, have just been working on this plan. And then I believe in partnerships very strongly. And all my businesses, and everything else, it's always been a partnership of some kind or another. Um, that uh, you know, we got involved uh, with when the Milwaukee County Historical Society did their beer museum exhibit. Then I got on, I was on the board of the Milwaukee County Historical Society. And that was a very successful exhibit. In fact, the most successful successful exhibit I think they ever had, uh, attendance-wise, and just the way it was presented and put together. You've got a great curator. Um, so that was that was good, and it showed that there was a lot of interest. So then it moved to um, they were able to get secure a space at the Grand Avenue. Did you ever get to see that or, or anything like that? No. And it was, uh, it wasn't a large space, but it was given to us for free. And uh, we developed it. It was the old um, restaurant and uh, made a very nice display. And it proved it could be economically feasible. Obviously, you need, no museum makes it on attendance, on, on income from ticket sales. So they, there was a bar there and beer sales is what helped. And then having events. So it proved it successful, and then now you saw the Grand Avenue is going through this resurgence again, uh, which is wonderful. And so we don't have that spot, so it's looking for space is a problem. In the meantime, we've also partnered, our group has, with the Wisconsin State Historical Society, and we're doing brewing at Old World Wisconsin. Brewing that would have been done, farm-style brewing, back in the 1860s or 70s, if you will, 70s. And it's um, proved very successful. We started out brewing like one, you know, all this, we've got all original equipment, most of it from Germany, big copper tubs and stuff like this, kettles, tubs, kettles. Um, we started out brewing three years ago, once a week, once a month. So like four or five times during the summer out there. And last summer it went to like almost every other week, almost depending upon what was going on. And next year they want us to brew every week. Every we're just brewing one day on weekends, um, Saturdays prominently. And uh, it it really has been a draw for home brewers to see a different thing. It's brought a lot of them out and other people. It's a it's a pretty good interactive thing. We've got there's some uh, some video on different state historical society websites and on the Museum of Beer and Brewing website. I think. Um, and then what's going to happen is they're going to we're actually going to build a brewery out there and it should be approved in the state budget and we've got a little bit of fundraising to do to get that done but then it'll be another event place out there so this is going to help old world wisconsin give more more to the population and to the visitors it'll be enhance the visitor experience 
So we're very excited about that, and that's been a couple of people who worked tire, tirelessly on this project. It's been a lot of work, but it's showing some good rewards. So that's that's the one vein the museum is doing, Museum of Beer and Brewing. And then until we find another location to partner with the Milwaukee County Historical Society to get something else opened in Milwaukee, which I hope is sooner than later, to um, keep this history going because the people that you know were involved in these businesses and these industries uh, Milwaukee would be a different town if the breweries weren't headquartered here. Uh, the innovations that came from the breweries, refrigeration, you know, the, the malt houses where Dad went to work afterwards. You know, Freighter was the largest malt house in the world where he worked, uh, headquartered here. Um, so it's it's a it's an interesting part of Milwaukee's history, and it's an integral part of Milwaukee's history. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> uh, did uh, like building your own brewery or just, I don't know, just restoring the history, was that always kind of in the back of your mind uh, when you were even in Idaho or no. when you came back, no? No, not, not until I started, you know, talking to people here and then, as I said, it, and the people that showed up at that funeral and stuff and then met some other people and, and you know, it just seemed like there's something that should be preserved. Okay. Did you ever think about preserving other aspects of Milwaukee history? No, I think I think it's done pretty well. I think Milwaukee is, you know, a visit Milwaukee, Milwaukee Visitor Center and the walking tours in Milwaukee. Um, there's a couple of, of kind of bus tours um, that point out a lot of the history stuff. Um, I think I think Milwaukee is pretty good. It's it, if you want to learn something, it's there to it's you can find it to learn it. When you came back. How had large businesses changed? Well, Milwaukee was headquarters, you know, for a lo lot of businesses. Look at Allen Bradley, uh, look at A.O. Smith, look at look at Briggs and Stratton, look at Harley Davidson, look at the names we know, mm -hmm. and um, you know, all those ownerships have have altered quite a bit. Um, you know, Allen Bradley sold to Rockwell, which put a lot of money in Milwaukee. Uh, to the the families, the Bradleys, um, you know, Schlitz ended up selling um, to Stroh, um, which was a disaster on all sides. <laughs> um, but the, but the businesses have evolved, and and you know, companies get bigger to the point where somebody buys them. Uh, you know, look at A.O. Smith. It's don't. There's nothing to look at. Uh, Alice Chalmers, I mean, talk about a, another huge Milwaukee business. I mean, these places employed thousands and thousands of people. Um, businesses evolve, you know, for some are sad and some are self-inflicted. Um, you know, what do you do? You, you move on to the next thing. So now if, you know, this resurgence in, in Madison on technology uh, with Epic and things like that, and, and with Foxconn coming in, so it's going to be a whole new ball game. I mean, STEM is everything there is right now. Uh, and there was just just an article in Wall Street Journal that to run the machines today, you need an, a, a college education because all these these um, you know to set up the machines is pretty sophisticated. How do you feel that? Uh, how do you feel the loss of those jobs has affected Milwaukee itself, just with the growing like poverty rate and everything? Well, it's affected a lot of a lot of families, certainly. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and some people are able to pick up and move on, and some people have a great deal deal of trouble picking up and moving on. Uh, you know, there is no such thing today as uh, you know the pension thing is going down the drain, certainly, I don't care who you work for. Mm -hmm. um, so you're more self-reliant, and it was kind of interesting uh, when I was in the printing business, you know, I talked some headhunters and stuff like that, and they said, you know, we don't, we don't even interview some people if they haven't had two or three jobs before. You know, so the idea of going to work for somebody and working there 35 years is, is really out the window. They want, they want people to have experiences at other businesses, but they also know once they hire them, there's a good chance you know, two or three years later, they could also move out that door. I said, where's the, where's the plus here? Mm -hmm. That's confusing to me. So, yeah, does it affect the families? Absolutely. Uh, 
you know, you've got to keep up with <laughs> times, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You've got to recreate yourself. Mm -hmm. What big business nowadays do you think is vital for Milwaukee? Well, certainly medical is pretty vital to Milwaukee. I mean, look what the medical complex is doing. Mm -hmm. That's pretty phenomenal. I think we're getting a very good name for that. I'm a, I'm a big, big believer in the medical college of Wisconsin um, and supporter. Um, you know, and then the technology that's coming in, we're getting people because we're, we are user-friendly and the price is right in Milwaukee. There's some startups that are coming here and uh, as long as, you know, look at, how can, who would have ever thought somebody went to UWM would be head of Microsoft? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just incredible on, you know, on the surface. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so Milwaukee's getting a very good reputation. Between Madison and, and Milwaukee, I mean, we are really, really quite, quite the quiet hub. Mm -hmm. Did you ever think Milwaukee was behind the shadow of, of Chicago? Well, I think for sure it's always been the, you know, kind of the back, the backyard, or if you will, or something like that. Um, our printing company, when we moved it to a bigger building, was on the south side in Oak Creek, and you know, we moved it, I think, 30, maybe 30 years ago about, and at that time it was really strong. They're saying, this is gonna be a quarter, 94 is gonna be built up all the way solid from Chicago to Milwaukee. And it's taken a long time, but it's, it's, you know, in fact, I mean, that's, you would think a pretty easy prediction. It should be pretty obvious. That would be a, a natural flow. Uh, it's just taken a lot longer than they thought. But, you know, you got IKEA, you got all the stuff that's built up there, and you get to the Illinois border and start looking north and see what's going on. It's, it's very, that real estate's gotten very expensive. What part of Milwaukee do you think has changed the most? Well, downtown certainly has had a pretty good, pretty good change, and you and you get out to this to the suburbs, if you will, and you can see the growth in those. I mean, you know, Brookfield is almost built out. I think there's two new subdivisions right now coming up, um, but and then you've got to go out further west to Delphi and stuff like that. Uh, north, Mequon's, you know, going up to Cedarburg, Ozaki County, south. You know, our growth is, you know, it's good news, bad news. It's just, it's done quite a good job when you look at, you know, take an a overview of, of how the growth has been. Um, Milwaukee downtown is doing a very good job east of the river. Now the challenge is getting west of the river between, uh, you know, between the river and Marquette, getting that whole area clean up, which Grand Avenue is going to go a long ways, moving the uh, symphony. Uh, that's going to be a great thing. Um, it's just, it, things take longer than, you know, everybody says, well, we're going to get this done. Well, it does get done, but it takes a long time to get it done, much longer than you anticipate. You brought up the symphony. Did you ever attend any concerts? At yeah, the... we were, for a number of years, we were season ticket holders. I love the symphony. Yeah. Did you attend any other theaters? Around yeah, we, we were season tickets. Um, you know, there's so many choices. Milwaukee is, you know, really, if you're into that stuff, there's, you can't say too many, but you know what do you decide to do? You can't do them all. Mm -hmm. So one year we'll do the we'll do the the, um, the Milwaukee Rep for you know a couple of years. We'll do the Skylight for a while. We'll do the Symphony for a while. We'll you know go through the thing, and then whatever touring companies come in, maybe you buy a season ticket for you know that. Um, but you start looking and you say, oh my gosh, you know, there's no. Well, first of all, you probably couldn't afford to do it all, mm -hmm. but time-wise, you can't do it all either. So you, you know, you'd like to support them all, but you do what you can as long as you're supporting something. When you were younger, did you have a fascination for theater and music? Well, I took I took band in junior high school, but then that kind of petered out. Um, yeah, I've always enjoyed music a lot. Did you attend any concerts at the Eagles Club? No, I've never... I, that is so strange. I've never been to the Eagles Club that I remember. I don't know if I did when I was a kid or not, but I can't. No, I never have. Have you guys? Yeah. I have not. Well, oh, you haven't. Oh. No, I, I have. You have. <laughs> it's not about me, though. <laughs> um, yeah. No, would you have any uh, any tokens that you currently have in your possession that are very memorable? 
from your past in Milwaukee? I got a room full. <laughs> this is a bottle from the, um, I'm not sure exactly, this is from the early 40s. It'd be right after Prohibition, I believe. And it's a picture of the rats color at the brewery was on the label. And uh, I was able, or my dad was able to save some of the stuff from the brewery. And then if you pan out, you can see that there's the barrel that was in the, um, on the label that was at the brewery, along with the clock that was on it. And those are the chairs my grandfather had made to go around the long table that was in the um, Rats Keller or hospitality room, if you will.